New York City. Soldiers of the 369th New York National Guard parade up Fifth Avenue. Many of these men are the sons and grandsons of the old New York 15th Infantry, the Harlem Hellfighters, who became famous in France as the 369th, the old Rattlesnake Regiment. A veteran of World War I remembers how he and 2,000 others volunteered to join this regiment. The first black American combat troops to fight on French soil. He also remembers how his regiment marched up Fifth Avenue while thousands of New Yorkers cheered. That was a long time ago. New York, 1913. State military law made no provision for young black men or even the black veterans of the Spanish-American War to join the New York National Guard. As early as 1898, black civic leaders backed a bill to amend the law. It had support from military and civilian organization and from Major Charles Young, the highest ranking black officer in the country. Within three months, the adjutant general shall organize and equip a colored regiment of infantry in the city of New York. Governor William Salza signed the bill into law in June, 1913. The bill got lost in political changeovers in Albany. Three years passed, nothing was done. In June, 1916, Governor Charles Whitman finally appointed someone to raise the regiment. William Hayward, lawyer from Nebraska, veteran of the Spanish-American War, and colonel in the National Guard. As public service commissioner of New York City, Haywood was familiar with the neighborhoods from which he would recruit. San Juan Hill, the Williamsburg section of Brooklyn, and Harlem. Men in search of work had brought their families from the British West Indies and from all over the South. Men like Frederick H. Williams, well, when I left the South in 1901, I was about 18 years old, came to New York. I've been here ever since. But I did a little of everything when I first came here. Elevator, cook, shine shoe, or anything, and then fight like hell to save my life. Colonel Hayward opened up his recruiting station in a cigar store in Harlem at the corner of 131st Street and 7th Avenue. No armory had been provided, so the new 15th Infantry would drill in the old Lafayette dance hall up the street. Recruiting was slow. But then the colonel had a stroke of luck. The most famous composer and band leader of the day joined the regiment. James Reese Europe, musical director for the dance team of Vernon and Irene Castle, who gave Europe much of the credit for their popularity. Highly disciplined composer and conductor, Jim Europe organized one of the first black musicians' unions in the country. The 
founder of the Clef Club Symphony Orchestra, became Colonel Hayward's biggest drawing card. Other talented musicians joined the regiment, the most popular of whom was Noble Sissel. Another friend of Jim Europe, and one of the first to lend support to the new regiment, was Ziegfeld Folly star, Bert Williams. Williams, a captain in the California National Guard, worked closely with Haywood in the early days of recruiting. Recruiting for an outfit that didn't even have rifles. Oh, well, there was training with broomsticks and uh, wooden guns in Central Park, Morningside Park, um, Manhattan. All over here, we're trained all around there, running around with broomsticks, down, down the street. So did Martin with sticks. <laughs> Martin the cuckoo guys again. <laughs> Sergeant Noble Sissel, drum major, and First Lieutenant James Reese Europe, bandmaster. Harvard track star, Napoleon Bonaparte Marshall, captain and the regiment's lawyer. Charles W. Fillmore, captain, Spanish-American war veteran. George C. Lacey, first lieutenant from the 8th Illinois. Major Whittemore and Captain Tandy. Arthur W. Little, major, owner of a printing firm. Laurelard Spencer, major, aircraft engineer and military secretary to the governor. And Hamilton Fish, progressive in the New York State Assembly, who had been a first lieutenant in the 71st Infantry, New York National Guard. I joined in a very peculiar way. I served in Plattsburgh a couple of years, a couple of summer training camps, and I was recommended for a captaincy uh, unanimously by the officers. So I went up there to take my examination. Uh, they call it. I had to appear up in Plattsburgh the next year. And then meanwhile, I had studied the drill regulations and hired someone to teach me, and I knew them backwards. So I knew I could pass any examination very easily. Uh, and then if they wanted to ask me in government history, well, I'd gone to Harvard and graduate with some honors, and that was, could have done that too. So I met an old major up there who didn't know me, and I don't suppose he was made a captain until he's well over 50 years old, and he was about 60 then, and a major. And when he heard that I was recommended for captain, uh, and I was 27, he thought I was much too young to be a captain. Well, I tried to argue with him. And I said, now, I've served three years in the state legislature. I went graduate honors in Harvard. I was captain of a football team that won the national championship. And I've done pretty well in business since. And I think I'm old enough to be a captain at 27. And I couldn't persuade him. Unfortunately, I didn't know at that time what I know today, that I had a direct ancestor in the Revolutionary War, Nicholas Fish, my great-grandfather. And I have the commissions signed in 1776, making my great-grandfather a major at the age of 18 and three months. And I was turned down for a captaincy at 27 years of age. And they wouldn't let me even take the exam because he said, if you take the exam, I'll ask you some questions about cooking in the drill uh, regulation, which you don't know, but I, I admitted that. I said, I don't know that. But I know the drill regulations as well as you do, and I want you to give me the examiner. He wouldn't do it. I said, I'll make you first lieutenant. So I went back to New York the next day, and I met Colonel Haywood, who was just beginning to organize this regiment. He said, will you come in with me as a captain? And I said, I will. And I joined him. I was one of the first organizers and helped build up that regiment. And I'm very proud of my part in it. And it turned out to be a, a very 
unique and a fine combat regiment. Training for trench warfare took place in the backyards and vacant lots of Harlem and Brooklyn. Colonel Haywood had enlisted the backing of socially prominent New Yorkers, and on October 1st, 1916, the 15th Regiment marched down Fifth Avenue to the exclusive Union League Club. Total strength, 607 officers and men. In official recognition, Governor Whitman and Colonel Daniel Appleton presented the regiment with the New York State flag. Six months later, with the declaration of war on April 6, 1917, recruiting was stepped up. The neighborhood ladies formed the 15th Women's Auxiliary and joined the drive to bring the regiment up to war strength. A volunteer from Brooklyn, Melville T. Miller. Well, as you know, it's a long time ago, of course. I was 16 years old, and uh, like most crazy kids, I imagine, they got their petty out of field and parades and whatnot. I, oh, my brother was drafted, and. I got that great feeling of a crazy kid, as I said before, and so I went up to the regiment and enlisted. Well, I hung around all day long in there, and uh, they said I had to have a parent's consent, and uh, I wasn't old enough, and so they wouldn't enlist me there. So they went to Van Cortland Park. They were in, in, tra in, in tents in Van Cortland Park. Up there, and I hung around all day long, and finally, uh, Lieutenant Kennedy, the medical doctor, so you really, really want to be in this thing, don't you? I said, yeah, I do. He said, well, I'll tell you, I'm going to put you in there. So he put my age up to 19 and a half years old. They wouldn't need parents' consent. And he signed me up. So from then on, I become a member. We were then the 15th New York Infantry. We hadn't got our federal designation of 369th. Every man felt he was in the best squad, in the best platoon, in the best regiment of the whole damn United States Army. Every man had that feeling. At Camp Whitman, New York, in July, the 15th Regiment was called to active duty and attached to the 27th Division, New York National Guard. A month later, they received orders to proceed to Camp Wadsworth, Spartanburg, South Carolina, along with the other regiments of the 27th Division. Spartanburg's mayor and the Chamber of Commerce announced, it is a great mistake to send Northern Negroes down here. We would not mind if they sent us a regiment of Southern Negroes. We understand them and they understand us. But with these Northern fellows, it is different. Despite the official protest, the 15th arrived in Spartanburg for combat training. We were down with the entire 27th Division. We weren't down there in more than two hours when trouble started with the crackers down south. If anybody hears a cracker, I, <laughs> I'm begging their pardon. But we went into a little conflict down there, and uh, to keep peace, Haywood pulled some strings and pulled us out of South Carolina and brought us to New York, one to Camp Mills, one battalion, one battalion to Van Cortland Park, one battalion to 68th Street Armory, where the 27th, 27th Division still stayed there. So while being restless, the battalion in Camp Mills under Captain Fish, right to the next camp was an Alabama regiment geared to go overseas. One there, 20 hours before we start another racial war. <laughs> we were all preparing to go abroad, and we had no arm, we had our rifles, we had no munitions. And we were told that the Alabama regiment was to attack us at night. The feeling was very bitter, and luckily, or well not now, but it, the joining 42nd, I think it's the New York regiment, gave us some ammunition. And so well, we just anticipated the war was going to begin right in America because uh, we told our soldiers 
that if they're attacked, they would have fight back. And if they were fired down, they would have fired back. And it looked as if it was going to be a sort of a bloody massacre that night. But uh, fortunately, at the last moment, they, when they found that we were armed, and uh, that would mean uh, bloodshed all down the line, uh, we were able to persuade the Alabama regiment that it wouldn't be worthwhile attacking. He was a fighter for his men. Him and, him and Hayward were two men you couldn't kick against. So Colonel Hayward pulled some kind of a strings and got us on the ship to go to France. After a lot of excitement on this ship, mothers coming down, pulling their kids off the ship in Hoboken Pier, because a lot of kids enlisted, they were too young, and they took them right off the ship, see? But nobody was there to take me off the ship. <laughs> so we went to France on a United States ship, Pocahontas. They were still in sight of the Narrows when the engine broke down. The Pocahontas returned to the Brooklyn Navy Yard for repairs and many soldiers got to spend Thanksgiving Day with their families. Just before sailing a second time, the ship caught fire and repairs took 10 days. They sailed again on the night of December 13th. Early the next morning, the Pocahontas collided with a British oil tanker, which tore a hole in the bow. Unwilling to face family and friends again, the men repaired the ship underway and kept on going. On December 26, 1917, Colonel Hayward wrote in his log, landed at Brest, right side up. And believe you, me, when I tell you that was the toughest time of the whole war. That was tough in all of the bullets and all of the fight and all of the little cooties and all of the hunger. Because we got in Brest and we got in boxcars and rode all night. And it was so cold, and we, geez, we were 40 in a car. And we landed in San Jose about 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. And believe me, it was something. Even harder to take was the hostile reception they got from some United States Marines. The first day in San Jose. That night they shot one of our men. We retaliated. Every time we went and found our old man dead, we found their man dead. We got battle got too hot between the Marines and us in, uh, in Sinders there. Yeah. They said, get them out of here, get them to hell to the front and let them fight because they're bloodthirsty. <laughs> the Marines, Marines were tough for it. I mean, they were tough, they were tough country boys. And we got into a camp, and we stayed there about a month and a half. And we found some other black soldiers there. But they were not fighting to us. They were stevedore regiments. The only black soldiers there were stevedores. But we were a fighting troop, according to our colonel. So if a guy is marching and his gun a little crooked, the guy next to him will kick him and say, straight in the goddamn life, you know, we're on some play, you know. They had pride in the company. We're the only individual regiment from any state in the old 48 states at that time ever left the shores to fight in a war under a state flag. And that's a violation of something, brother. <laughs> now, let me stress, I say this, with no mental reservation, I say this proudly, we had the best band in the whole United States Army under the command of Jim Europe. There were hundreds of regiments and all had bands. And we had competition with these regiments. And our band uh, won all the competition easily under Jim Europe. Uh, first, they had nowhere else to assign them. 
And I knew him, so they assigned him to my company, and, and he ate with me regularly. Uh, the, 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 the blacks are, are, are very musical, and they liked it, and they were very good. In some of the different instruments, they were not so good, and we spent, uh, we had a very rich man who put up, I think, $10,000 to import some people from Puerto Rico who, were, who could uh, play some of the instruments that the American blacks couldn't do. So we, that uh, band was perfected. It was known as the, really the greatest band. It went to the southern part of France, to where with the hospitals, and played all over. So we laid around San Jose for about two or three months, going down to the pier, unloading ships. To do all kind of details, but not fight. And our Colonel, Colonel William Haywood, at least I brought over here for fighting regiment, not stevedores. But we didn't see the Colonel for about three months. He was off in Paris someplace negotiating. He said, I brought fighting troops and they're gonna fight. General Pershing, Commander of the American forces didn't know where to put the New York 15th. The War Department refused to mix black and white combat troops. There had been plans for an all-colored 93rd Infantry Division, but there was no sign of it yet. And meanwhile, the men of the 15th would have to serve as labor troops. But the British and French needed reinforcements immediately. They had been at war since 1914 and had lost over a million men. The French army was on the verge of collapse, and the Germans were now just 60 miles outside of Paris. It was then decided to lend the British and French four American, white, divisions and the 15th Infantry New York National Guard. Colonel Haywood returned from general headquarters with a proposal for his men. Do we want to be stevedores or want to fight with the French? We said, fight with the French. We didn't come here to be stevedores. The hell with the stevedores. Every man's voice, matter when that barracks had 9 1 voice. Okay, we said, well, you will fight, you'll fight. That's what he told us. So we fought with the French. And we turned in all of our American equipment. That was our canteens, our rifles, our army belts, and our helmets. We issued French helmets, French rifles, French ammunition, French canteens, and instead of water and canteen, we issued French wine. And we joined the 4th French Army. The head of that was General Gouraud. He was uh, an old uh, French foreign officer, fought in Africa, he lost his arm in battle, and a very uh, fine character. And he liked our troops because he was accustomed uh, to black troops. And uh, we got on very, very well with him. I'd gone to school in Switzerland and knew French not fluently, but well enough, I had to make the main speech there to them and, uh, and tell them that our troops were coming and they were coming so fast that sooner or later we're going to win this war. The French had to make it, they had to be, hold the front until they got there. And we were just the first part of it, the colored troops were there. And Guru gave us a great reception, I remember that.
The Argonne Forest was a very quiet sector. There was practically no action. It's just an old French division was holding the section. I imagine the same was on the side of the enemy. And there was no action at all. So they took our outfit and they assigned us to this French regiment. Each man had a French soldier with him. And they were together. Now, neither one can understand any other one's language. I had a little high school French, and I could say a few words, but it meant nothing. So when you're on post at night there with the Frenchman, and he, he always called the German the Bosch. And the other, he'd say, shh, Bosch, Bosch, if you heard something. But then sometimes he'd say, shh. And now we're all excited. Kids from New York, all of a sudden, are in a war and scared to death and everything else. So every time we saw a blade of grass move, bang, we shot, no, 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 no. Say, pop barge, pop barge means that's not to that. So it seems that they were so quiet, but they weren't worried about the so-called barge. They were hunting the wild boars that was coming through the Argonne Park. We knew nothing about it. So this friend said, shh, shh, he had his quiet, and all of a sudden, bang, he shoots. He kills a wild boar. See? Then they talk about barbecue later on. They'd cut out pieces and have, we had got to eat. So that was a strange part. That was the only train we got was with this French red. But our boys being so eager and scared and interested in the war, every time they saw something, they shot. Now, this woke the front up because the enemy was getting fired upon more often than they had been. So they started retaliating. That's when the Argonne Forest became one of the most famous battlefields of all times, especially World War I. Ironically, it was from the French that the men of the 15th learned for the first time their new federal designation. They were now the 369th U.S. Infantry Regiment. By the end of May, the regiment was under fire in advanced positions. A major German offensive was expected at the end of May, but the attack didn't take place until July 14th. Exactly at midnight on Bastille Day, the German guns opened fire and the Battle of Champagne-Marne began. p.m. on the 15th, the word was passed down. All along the line, the 4th French Army had held. A letter arrived from General Gouraud. It is a hard blow for the enemy. It is a beautiful day for France. The young men from Harlem and Brooklyn fought side by side with the French African troops, the Senegalese, and the French 2nd Moroccan Division. Well, the Moroccans were good, good, very good fighters and brave fighters, except one thing. Now, I might be questioning on this, and I don't care. It's from what I seen and what I heard. They could not stand the shell fire and the loud explosion of the big guns. Yeah, they figured it was something from the heavens. They, uh, but for fighting, they used to go over the top with their rifles sling, uh, slung over their backs, you know, with their uh, knives in their hands. 
They were game, and they wouldn't take no prisoners. They wouldn't take no prisoners. Now, I can say this without fair contradiction. I might be wrong in the amount, but it's something like 200 or 500 francs the French government paid every Moroccan who brought in a prisoner alive. I could have bought in a thousand, I wouldn't get a quarter. But they didn't bring any prisoners, they killed them. They cut their ears off and strung them on a string, tied them around their waist. That was it for the, for the Moroccans. They shaved without lather. What more can I say about the Moroccans? And there was no racial prejudice. They were all colors and all shades. They were black with kinky hair. They were white with blonde hair, but they're all Moroccans. But our boys was pretty good with their knives, too. Henry Johnson and Needham Roberts, two boys in the platoon commanded by Lieutenant Pratt. They were holding out a certain section up in the, in the Argonne, and it seems that we always had listening posts, you see? Now, I'll explain if you don't know what a listening post was in that type of warfare. This was nothing like the Korean or Vietnam. See, when the troops are holding a trench, very little activity, every night there's, they had a post set maybe 200, 300 feet from the main body in the trench. And every night they put two men out there just to listen and warn if there was going to be a sneak attack. But of course the Germans on that were doing the same thing. So this particular night, Henry Johnson, who was one of the greatest heroes, even greater than Sergeant York, which everybody knows of, were out there when these Germans attacked the listen post. Now approximately 24 Germans attacked. Needham Roberts got slugged almost immediately, and Johnson fought them off. He shot and he cut and he swung his wife around and he defeated the 24 Germans. Those they didn't wound or kill, cut out. He had 21 wounds in his body, but he refused to die. And it took Johnson and Roberts. We finally got out there in the morning and dragged their bodies back. They weren't dead and both lived through it. Sorry to say today they're both gone. Well, I'm sorry to say today I can say almost anything because most all of them are gone. I'm 75 years old, and I was only 17 then. So it ain't many guys that were 25 or 30 that's here to contradict what I'm telling you. By the end of the summer, the other regiments of the 93rd Division were in France. The 370th, 371st and 372nd, men from Connecticut, District of Columbia, Illinois, Massachusetts, Ohio, Maryland, Tennessee, and South Carolina. But the 93rd was never to fight as a division. The three new regiments, like the 369th, were attached to French divisions. In September 1918, all moved into position for the major Allied offensive the Battle of Meuse Argonne. But when we started up the hill that day in Argonne Forest, he was held up here loose. Come to him over here, the French Blue Devil on this side, and come to see, we're going up the hill, let me <clears throat> a yell, and that yell was a signal. When we started the hill, most of our men got it from head down.
final War Department report. The casualties of the four black infantry regiments of the 93rd Division, 3,925 killed and wounded. Frontline trenches do not all going for us. You see, I'm going to tell you. I'm sitting here talking, but I don't like it. See? Now, after the war was over, we won the war. We let the Germany clean out of France. advance guard of the 4th French Army. We were the first troops to go into the enemy territory in Alsace Lorraine, beautiful place. As we marched into this particular town, I really don't quite remember the name, I think it was called Bitch Villa. The colonel, before we marched in, gave us a command to uh, get into formation. And we straightened up, I struck up the band, and the flag of New York State was flying with the 15th New York Infantry and the New York, our colors flying. And as we approached the town, at the outskirts of the town, which no more than three to 500 feet, maybe, wild well, guess that is, of course, you will see the, the German troops leaving. They're marching out of the town, and we come in with the band playing the Army Blues. And Jim Europe and uh, Noble Sister was not our band master, our drum major at that time. It was a fellow named Thompson, who has since has passed. And we marched in at that time, and the people was on both sides. And they were waving. They didn't know whether we were coming as conquerors or liberators. But they were playing the safe, and they would cheer. Whether they were cheering and happy out of fear to win us over, whether they really were happy, I have no way of telling. But that day the sun was shining and we were marching and the band was playing, everybody's head high. And we were all proud to be Americans, proud to be black and proud to be in the 15th New York Infantry. What's your next question? <laughs> We spent 191 days in the frontline trenches. We never lost a foot of ground or a prisoner. So I think that's a greater record than my medal, because my medal is unimportant. I can sit here and brag all day long. But the medal I got, every member of our outfit got. The entire regiment was decorated with a quarter gear by the French government. I had an individual citation plus the medal, but a quarter gear, the cross of war, was given to every man in the 15th New York we carried on our flag today. Well, while in the town, we were the boss. Our colonel was just like the town mayor, and we were policemen of the town. We stayed there quite a while. And uh, as the sons and husbands and fathers who were serving in the German army started to come home, 
We don't know what they're planning. So the colonel gave all that. No more than two or three men could get on the corners and discuss things and whatnot, so we had to break that up. So we had that old play of the town. Okay. And of course, the men liked it because the women seemed to be very much excited. There's something they've never seen black people. They might have read about them in their books, but never seen them. The kids used to run up and want to run the hand in the face, see if it would come off, you know? And the women played up there, and the men had a ball. They loved it there, because whether these gals, I don't know yet today, as I look back at my age of 75, whether they were giving in to these soldiers because in fear, or just they were novelty, or just whether they were just loose. But all the women couldn't be loose. And so it was a wonderful thing. We had no rapes, no crime, nothing on ours. We did nothing to disgrace ourselves, but we had a ball. <laughs> Most wonderful day of my life, the day we marched up Fifth Avenue. The first outfit to march onto that Victory Arch down there was on 23rd Street, 22nd Street. That's one day that it wasn't the slightest bit of prejudice in New York City. That day, and tell you what day it was? February 1919. Let me see, it must have been February the 21st. Because I was, we came back to Camp Upton, where we, uh, we uh, were all discharged, on the 22nd day of February, Washington's birthday, 1919, where I came home from the Army. I was 19 years old then. along up Fifth Avenue, everybody was astounded that we used a new mass formation, 16 abreast. And it was never seen before in this country it was a formation we learned in France from the French instructors. And it was quite a sight. to Harlem, we opened up the ranks so that the family and friends could see their loved ones. 
And believe me, they took a good look. Everybody wanted to shake his hand. Oh, terrific. Okay. Terrific. Oh, we marched up Fifth Edna. We had parties. We had all oh, the feeling was terrific. Everybody was happy. Everybody was wonderful. After the parade at the army, and then at the, over here on the Harrison Avenue Army in Brooklyn, had a big dinner. Seems that all these girls from the different churches and so forth volunteered their services. And I met one little girl there who I married later. And I stayed with her for 52 years. That's the picture you saw upstairs. And she's gone. She died in 72. But I met her at that reception coming home from France. No God knows how many of them come back, because I didn't come back with the regiment. When I came back, I came back in casualty ship. I still am here to talk. Thank God for that. But when I came home, uh, from the war, I was elected to Congress. Now, I haven't got many blacks in my district, but because I served with black troops, I think all the black troops in the country thought I was their representative. And I would get these thousands of letters of wanting compensation and all that. Anti-lynching bill, I put that in. The, uh, then there came the, uh, uh, the Battle Monument bill. Uh, which I had lots of difficulty of doing. And I owed it, of course, and there's an obligation. Those blacks who died, they're fighting for freedom and democracy, as we told them. And I said, these boys fought and died, just the same as the white boys did, fighting to defend their country and fighting for democracy and justice. And uh, they're entitled to this monument as, as much as anybody else. And, uh, and so I got it through the house by just putting the pressure on. And uh, we got it through the house, and uh, I don't know what happened to it then. It took 10 years for something to happen. In 1937, the monument was built in the Champagne District on the plains of Sompi. An inscription reads, erected by the United States of America to commemorate the achievements of our soldiers and those of France who fought in this region in World War I. Ripon, Chéchou, Ardeuil, Trier, j'étais mobilisé à l'armée de telle sorte... I had been fighting in the Champagne region since 1915. A lieutenant in 1918. Albert Ferrinck. Un beau jour, on nous a dit vous recevez en renfort, non pas en stage, des troupes américaines, des troupes noires. Et nous One day, some American troops were assigned to us, black troops, not as trainees, but as reinforcements, and it was our job to look after them. Naturellement, je les ai mis. So I paired them up with my men. The idea was to give them a chance to get to know one another and for the French to help their new comrades in arms adjust to being for the first time in the front line. At first, getting reinforcements surprised us. But it made us very happy to think 
that this was a prelude to the full-scale American effort to help us chase the Germans out of our country. That was our first reaction. And then, of course, we felt a great deal of respect for these men who had come 10,000 kilometers to save our country, but who also risked staying behind in the trenches where we lost so many soldiers, so many men. Again, all my gratitude to our black friends of 1918. To my old friends, thank you. Frederick H. Williams, 103-274, Company C, 16th Squad, I taught the men when they come to us, train them rather. When I got out of service, I swore I would never serve another day in this man's army. Because I had never, I know there's been prejudice and all that, yeah, but it never touched me in personally. You know, I went to school, I come home. My father was fairly well fixed. We ate good and we dressed good and went to school. And didn't run into these things. But I ran into it in the army. Oh, the army saw, I swore I'd never serve another day in the army. And then, of course, when Pearl Harbor struck, you know, it was the same feeling I had in 1917 when my brother was drafted and the war started, so then I went back in again. See? So that's as simple as that. See? Purple mind, 
This program was made possible in part by grants from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the National Endowment for the Arts.